America's number one show on pop culture and politics. This is the Michael Medved Show. And another great day in this greatest nation on God's green earth. A great nation where, yes, we have a constitution that says that we cannot have government imposing religious faith on anybody. That's what it means in the First Amendment to the Constitution, where it says Congress shall make no law respecting establishment of a religion. But we do have a government that uh, has always thrived with a religious populace. In other words, we have a secular government, but a religious country. It's always been that way in the United States. So why is it that people are allergic to the idea of a... um, Little sign that says, Welcome to White Marsh Township, a great place to live, work, and worship. 1-800-955-1776. It is. By the way, White Marsh Township is a nice place just outside of Philadelphia. And it was established in 1704. And it was established by deeply religious people some Quakers, and some uh, very pious German people as well who are immigrants to White Marsh Township. But today, there is a um, little bit of a fight going on as it's been raised by a supervisor in White Marsh Township whose name is Jim Totten. He is a lifetime uh, township resident. And he remembers that when he was younger, they used to have a sign that said, Welcome to White Marsh Township, a great place to live, work, and worship. But at some point in those uh, pesky 1980s, yeah, but under President Reagan, apparently, uh, somebody had the idea that it was unacceptable to say worship in the sign. So now the sign, it looks like a handsome sign, And signs all over town say, Welcome to White Marsh Township, a great place to live and work. Doesn't have the same ring to it, does it, as to live, work, and worship? Would you be offended? Does it seem to you somehow to violate some important principle to have a sign that says that a town is a good place to live, work, and worship? Uh, Here's here's the story. And there's another dispute like this, which... Actually, it's coincidentally, it's also in the Philadelphia area, a Villanova University, which uh, is a basketball powerhouse, not so much this year. And by the way, too bad about the Gonzaga Bulldogs of not winning that national championship. I was interested in them actually winning. And congratulations to all the Tar Heels in North Carolina, et cetera, et cetera. But OK, Villanova University um, is a Catholic university. Surprise. And they're talking about building a pedestrian bridge, an overpass, on the school's property. And this is entirely on the property of this Catholic university. And I've seen the designs for the overpass bridge. Looks very handsome. It has some crosses on it. It's a Catholic university. And some locals are objecting. The League of Women Voters locally in Radnor, Pennsylvania, have objected. Are you kidding me? No, not kidding. If you think folks are right to object, you can give us a call. 1-800-955-1776. Okay, here's first the story from White Marsh Township. And um, it's in Montgomery County, suburban Philadelphia. A local elected official in Montgomery County wants to get back to a time when worshiping held as much weight as living and working in his town. White Marsh Supervisor Jim Totten, a lifelong township president, says he remembers when roadside signs welcoming drivers included the words, Welcome to White Marsh Township, a great place to live, work, and worship. At some point along the way, the signs dropped the word worship. It's very blasé, Totten said of the current slogan. Everybody has that sign now because everyone is afraid to step on anyone's toes. Totten, surprise, surprise, is the only Republican on the town's five-member board. And I looked it up. Uh, White Marsh Township votes very reliably uh, Democratic. 
And uh, they did last time as well. Donald Trump got 43% in White Marsh Township. But so what? What's wrong? Is, are, are, are people who vote Democratic uh, aller- allergic to the idea that it's a nice thing, that uh, people have various places of many, many religious denominations that they can worship in White Marsh Township and throughout the United States, by the way? Totten doesn't know when the sign changed. But according to a recent published report, a member of the White Marsh Township Business Association said the organization that White Marsh Township Business Association was behind the design and creation of one of the present signs and the now prevalent slogan back in the early 1980s. He said the word worship was not involved in the discussion of the sign eventually erected at Miles Park. So in any event, it's kind of a mystery how they change this from live, work, and worship to live and work. If the township board eventually takes up Totten's idea to restore the word worship before he leaves office next January, the new signs would be paid for through private donations. Okay, so you don't have the problem of using taxpayer money to promote worship, none of that. He does not yet know when he plans to introduce a resolution. He's still gathering opinions from residents. He says the people that have been against it have thrown out the reasoning of separation of church and state, but it has nothing to do with it. They're off on that, Supervisor Taunton said. He said, if you go back in history, we wanted to leave England because we wanted to worship the way we wanted. Worship doesn't mean you have to go to this church or to that church. You could worship that tree in your front yard. Well, actually, not according to the Bible, but uh, the Bible isn't the law of the land. Uh, So go ahead, worship the tree. Druids do that, right? 1-800-955-1776. I do think that this idea that it would be controversial for anyone to have a slogan that says a great place to live, work, and worship that in a small town uh, in suburban Philadelphia, that that would cause any debate or need to be changed or changed back or fought over. I think this is part of what has gone wrong in American life is that part of what has always strengthened this country has been the idea that we don't all think worship, practice, live exactly the same. But as long as you respect your neighbors and as long as you're considerate of what they are going through and the decisions and choices they make, we grant uh, Americans great freedom of choice. And the notion that someone who was, say, a militant atheist, and I'm sure there are some militant atheists in White Marsh Township, as there are in every town in America. And yes, it's true that polling shows that about one out of four Americans today says that that individual has no religious affiliation. But that, by the way, does not mean that those so-called nuns, people who have no religious affiliation, that they don't believe in God. Because all of these same surveys that show that that's the case, that one out of five or one out of four Americans say they are not affiliated with any religion. When you ask those people, do you believe in God? More than 80% of them say, yeah. And in fact, a majority of them say they pray regularly. These are people without religious affiliation. So the idea that uh, a town is a great place to live, work, and worship, would you be uncomfortable if someone put that kind of sign on your town, now it may not be true. I I don't know if you put a sign like that on Berkeley, California, is Berkeley, California, a great place to live, Mm, to work? Absolutely not. Uh, Or to worship? Well, probably that because there are all kinds of alternatives. Uh, Dave in Columbus, Ohio. Dave, you're on the Michael Medved show. Hi, Michael. Great topic. I'm glad you're shining the spotlight on this. Uh, The solution to this problem is that the Republicans need to start appointing conservative activist judges to counter the liberal activist judges who create rulings from the bench. The whole idea is that uh, the Democrats should be thrilled with Neil Gorsuch because he's a constitutionalist. He's not going to radically alter the precedent. 
But the, the liberals have relied on this separation of church and state to have the ACLU win these cases. But the point is there is no separation of church and state in the Constitution. So a conservative activist judge could overturn all this previous precedent and just say, we're going we're gonna to allow the uh, signs that advocate for worship in the public square. We're just going to overthrow all this. Okay, precedent. let me stay on the line. I, I want to explain to you why I disagree with you, actually. Uh, we will get back to that and to the case of the pedestrian bridge with crosses on it at a Catholic university. Coming up. 1-800-955-1776. The Michael Medved Show. Twenty-one minutes after the hour on the Michael Medved show, talking about the role of religion in American life. Religion is important to most Americans. Uh, I mean, you have between seventy-five and eighty percent of Americans who say they are affiliated with one religious faith or another. About forty percent of Americans go to church or synagogue or mosque services every single week. If you count people who go at least once a month, it's a majority of Americans. So this remains a deeply religious country. So why are people allergic to things like a sign that says um, in White Marsh Township, Pennsylvania? uh, Welcome to White Marsh Township, a great place to live, work and worship. Let me go back to Dave in Columbus. Um, Dave here's here's the problem that I have with what you're saying is you're saying that conservatives should appoint judicial activist judges. I don't believe that's true because I think judicial activism by its very nature is not conservative. In other words, conservatives believe in the constitutional process and the constitutional process is not legislating from the bench. This is something Jefferson was very concerned about. Madison was concerned about it. And it seems to me that we run into a great deal of trouble when we say that all that matters is the result. Conservatives have to be concerned about process. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be concerned about winning. Of course we should. But if you win in the wrong way, in other words, if you win by the stroke of a pen without persuading people, without expressing the will of a majority of people, I'm not sure that that's not a victory that might cost you more than you would gain, a Pyrrhic victory, in other words. You follow the argument? Yes, I do, and I I respect you greatly, Michael. You're a very honorable man and a very principled man. Try to be. We're fighting fighting against uh, rules for radicals, the principles of Saul Alinsky, which says no matter what, we're going to go ahead and advance the needle leftward, leftward, and we Republicans and conservatives seem to have no way of ever taking it back once something gets established. But see, this is the, this is the point. We're winning, don't you think? I mean, I think on a whole range of issues, most, most prominently the human life issue, uh, we have been very successful in persuading lots of folks. Now, you could say there's one issue in which we've lost spectacularly. There's more than one, but one in particular, which is the redefinition of marriage. But... It, if if you look right now at at it, I, I take it you're a person of faith, Dave. And would I be correct? Yeah. Do you feel that there is any that you are subject to any sort of persecution or discrimination or hardship because of practicing your faith? No, not when I practice my faith. No. Okay, me neither. And 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 again, and I think that we should be very very careful also about about crying wolf in that regard. I I appreciate... Let me make one final comment about the subject of abortion. Sure. I think you're right. We are winning on abortion, and the way to continue to win on abortion is to let the women come forth and speak for conservatives on that issue. When I have heard men talk about abortion, I see the women, their, their resistance just rises. A man speaking against abortion, the women say, well, then don't have one. So we conservatives will win on the subject of abortion when us men stop talking about it and let the women lead, conservative women lead for our side on this issue. I I think you're entirely correct. And by the way, the polling shows very consistently that women tend to be more pro-life 
than men. Men, uh, a lot of men are very pro-choice or even pro-abortion because it removes consequences for certain patterns of action. Let's go uh, to Norma in Pasadena, California. Norma, you're on the Michael Medved Show. Good morning. Hey, good mo- Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. Um, I just thought maybe you'd be interested in a point of view of a 95-year-old lady that's seen politicians and administrations come and go and how I... Yeah, and Norma, why don't you turn off the radio in the background? Oh, okay. That'll be good. That'll be good. And then yeah, we'll we'll hear the ninety five year old point of view. Ninety five years old and still kicking, but I, I can see. It's appalling to me what what people worry about these days. It's talking about that little sign in Pennsylvania. They've got too much time on their hands to worry about things like that. When what do they think those churches are for? People worshiping the churches. Yeah, exactly right. And and Norma, you're right. I will tell you this other story the, from the Philadelphia area, the story about Villanova, uh, is even more striking. And um, uh, Norma, thank you for calling and for being still kicking uh, at, at age 95. And bless you. Um, it, Villanova University um, <laughs> it had planned to construct this pedestrian bridge, which is supposed to be good, right? It was going to ease congestion of vehicular traffic because, in other words, it wouldn't need a stop sign or crosswalk. It goes over a public street. And uh, it's a wheelchair accessible bridge, completely Americans with Disability Act compliant. It's over a busy road. It actually leads to mass transit, right? Liberals are supposed to love it. But the bridge, at either end of the bridge, it has two pillars on both sides. And those pillars pillars are crowned by four-foot, seven-inch tall crosses. It's a Catholic university. The uh, president of uh, the university, of Villanova University, points out that uh, his name is Father Peter Donahue. He points out on every building on campus there's a cross. There's a big church. There's a great big cross. So what's the problem with this? The, The League of Women Voters has taken off against this. Susan Snyder has reported that they regard the crosses as, quote, an audacious show of religion that has no place in a township of many faiths. Well, why not on private property, for goodness sake? And uh, by the way, the, the local governing board voted six to nothing to allow the university to go ahead and build this bridge. But is it really required that people react like vampires to a show of a cross. Uh, let's go to Robert in uh, Moreau Township, New Jersey. You're on the Michael Medved show. Yes, Michael. Thank you so much for doing what you do. We need your voice. You bet. Michael, uh, I'm really glad that you just clarified um, the pedestrian bridge at Villanova because initially you hadn't indicated, unless I missed it, that it was going over a public uh uh, roadway. Correct. It was, but all, all the construction, of course, is taking place on private property because it goes over the public roadway. Yeah, but go I ahead. Yes, I understand that. But part of the issue is that the two pillars that connect the property or the, the bridge that goes across the public roadway is, is physically part of that structure. So I happen to agree with you. Let me preface to say that, yes, I certainly believe in separation of church and state. And I certainly believe that any religious entity on their property should be able to identify their religion. Amen. Uh, Meanwhile, uh, speaking about religious rights, one of the most successful movies in recent years, independent films, is a movie called God's Not Dead. It was produced by and starring Kevin Sorbo, who has a new project. He's going to be telling us about it coming right up on the Medved Show. Four minutes after the hour on the Michael Medved show, and we've been talking uh, quite a bit about um, audio versions of uh, great books. Uh, I've been uh, absolutely shameless in promoting uh, the great audio version of uh, my wife's new bestseller, Don't Divorce. But 
there's a, a book that sold even more and even better than Don't Divorce that is actually the subject of a new... It's, it's not fair to say it's an audio version because it's a full production and it sounds very different and it sounds very remarkable and it features a lot of Hollywood celebrities who actually participate in the project on 18 CDs. It's called The Breathe Bible. The first 18 CDs in this series cover the New Testament. The key man behind this project, the producer and one of the stars, is Kevin Sorbo. Uh, Kevin, congratulations on the new project. Well, thank you so much. I, I can't say I'm the key man. I think the key man is a gentleman by the name of Carl Amari who contacted me. And uh, I, I did help in sort of uh, getting together a few of the slubs and all, but he, he is the mastermind behind this, and it's been a wonderful project to be part of. Well, I- again, usually uh, producers like to play God, but you actually get to play God in uh, the Breathe Bible, right? Uh, yes, yes, I do. We, I, I, I got the honor of, uh, of being God's voice in the New Testament, even though he's, you know, he's a little busy in the Old Testament, and we're going to record that later in the year. But uh, this is where we came out first, and what a better way to come out with Easter just around the corner, because the, the New Testament, as you know, deals a little bit with Jesus. <laughs> yes, and Josh Lucas, who is a fine actor, uh, your colleague plays uh, plays Jesus, or voices Jesus, in... Uh, the Breathe Bible. Information about this project, by the way, is posted up at our website at michaelmedved.com. And people can actually listen to some of this to see some of the high production values that are available here. I had a question. You, of course, uh, you and, and your wife, Sam, are very well known for your Christian commitment. You're very well known for the great success of one of the most successful independent movies of all time, God's Not Dead where you starred and, and, and really helped to create that movie. Are the other people who participate in this project also believers, or some of them yes, some of them no, other people just wanted to be part of a, an important project? I think for the most part, most of them are believers. I mean, there wasn't you know, a criteria for us. We, they, they know what this is about. If they're going to be uncomfortable with it, I don't think they would have done it. So um, I, got, I got to say that they just they, they saw the value in the project. They, they, they wanted to be part of it, and... Um, you know, everybody involved. I mean, there's, there's over 80 actors, you know, doing the different voices uh, of the biblical characters in the New Testament. And I call it theater for the mind because really it's, you, you've got an orchestra in the background. You've got sound effects. You've got the jeering and cheering and crying and praying. I mean, you're going to hear the nails going into Jesus when he's up on the cross. I mean, it's, it's really incredible. And I, I, I just think that it's, uh, uh, what I call it theater for the mind is because when you close your eyes, you're going to feel like you're there. You're going to feel like you're watching a movie, and you just sort of close your eyes to sort of get a different picture in your mind. Because the mind, to me, that's why people all say books are better, right? Because um, you, you, the mind is an amazing theater. Well, it's it's also because this goes back to uh, the, the uh, uh, Gospel of John, of course, begins with, in the beginning was the Word. Uh, the Bible, uh, both New Testament and Old Testament, is about words, not images. And I think it's one of the reasons that for a lot of people, reading the text or even hearing the text as they will in the Breathe Bible works better than uh, usual, usually most biblical epics, which, which end up seeming a little bit like Monty Python's Life of Brian. <laughs> That's true. And look at Hollywood did to Noah. Uh, yeah, well, okay. I mean, again, there there are tons of them you can pick out. I mean, I think the, the uh, Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, is... Uh, feels uh, at least a little bit more authentic, but that's that's not what's happening here because what's happening here is basically the text uh, performed by extremely accomplished actors, uh, very well directed. How? At what point did you have more than oh three or four people recording at once? Did, was there ever a situation where there were a group of the actors who came together to make this happen? You know, only on a few occasions. Most of the people, because of schedules and everybody's, you know, running around different cities, different places, and different projects, it really just came down to somebody like my, you know, myself going to the studio with whatever the sound technicians were there. But certainly, um, Carl uh, was there to give direction and uh, sort of guide people of where he wanted this, this his vision to go. So it was, uh, it, like, like I said, it's just I, I just think it's great. And I don't see you mentioned earlier it's got 18 CDs, but if people don't want to get the box set, which I think it's amazing. I'm still one of those guys who like CDs and DVDs, just like I like a real book in my hand. 
as well, but um, you can also do the digital download on wh whatever, you know, however way you listen to it. And for me, living in a city like Los Angeles and so many other cities that have horrible traffic, I'm a big fan of audio books just to catch up instead of um, constantly just listening to some music all the time. I think it's great to listen to, uh, I'm a big fan of talk radio as well, big fan of yours. And I just think it's a, a great way to hear the word and hear the Bible read in such a way that, you know, I've got friends who don't want to read the Bible because they think it's boring. They go, have you ever read the Bible? And I go, well, no. <laughs> so it's, to me, it's a different way to sort of open it up to people and bring it into a digital world, so to speak, and our, our fast-paced uh, way we live our lives. The uh, Breathe Bible, it's posted up at our website. I'm holding the very handsome box here in my hand. Kevin Sorbo, thank you for everything you do to uplift and enlighten our culture. Uh, meanwhile, this word from Relief Factor, this came in from Ronald from Arkansas. He says, I fractured my neck in 1969. I've seen orthos, chiros, family docs, and nothing worked as much as Relief Factor. Last July, I injured my Achilles tendon, but now I can walk without pain. Nothing to lose but your pain and the whole world to gain. Go to relieffactor.com. That is relieffactor.com. We'll be right back on the MedVet Show. Forty-four minutes after the hour on the Michael Medved show, uh, Kevin Sorbo uh, may be best known for well his role as Hercules on TV, but also he was uh, very well known for his starring role in a movie that he helped to produce uh, called God's Not Dead, made sixty million dollars. A sequel made another twenty million, and no, the sequel wasn't called God's Still Not Dead. It was called God's Not Dead Two. And and those movies, both of them, had to do with challenges that people were facing in uh, campuses and in, in life from a militantly secular culture. But is secularism the same thing as hostility to Christianity? Because it, it seems to me that it's very important that we keep this straight. And And by the way, when you read stories like this Villanova story, you can understand why why people feel there is a special hostility to Christianity. Um, for instance, a, a member of the League of Women Voters in Radnor, Pennsylvania, said, are there less ostentatious ways to reflect a Catholic institution? She's talking about crosses on top of pillars <laughs> on school property for a Catholic school. Uh Really, a Catholic institution should be shy about displaying crosses. And uh, then at uh, one of the opponents of this overpass that they're building that has these pillars on it is a um, someone named Sarah Pilling, who lives near the Villanova campus. She spoke to the Philadelphia Inquirer and she said, I think the Villanova administrators are overstepping their sense of ecumenicism to shove their crosses in our faces. In in our actually, they're about you'd have to be about thirty feet tall to have this cross in in your face. It's actually kind of overhead. Why is that a problem? Can you think of other symbols that would be a problem? One eight hundred nine five five seventeen seventy six. Let's go to Rich in Villanova, Pennsylvania. You're on the Michael Medved show. Uh, Michael, uh, yes, I'm, I'm sitting in my office not five minutes from the uh, proposed uh, overpass, and uh, I do want you to know I'm not a, not a graduate of Villanova, um, but, um, you know, it, it has been a, a wonderful institution. It's been around for a long time, and uh, the improvements that they're planning are, are going to benefit the community, but well, this story first broke in January when there was a meeting in front of the design review board. And that was prior, as you said, um, that ultimately the board of commissioners did approve this. But prior to that, it was there was a meeting in front of this design review board. And some of the comments, which were reflected in a local, um, you know, the local newspaper, I mean, talk about exactly what you say, this this sort of virulent uh, anti-Christianity or and also kind of this complete lack of respect for private property rights that 
So let me just read a few of these remarks, and one of them was by the woman you mentioned, Sarah Pilling. So he, here were a couple <laughs> of the remarks at the meeting. One woman stands up and says, what message does this ornament send to those who drive on Lancaster Avenue? Asked Roberta Winters, president of the Radnor League of Women Voters. You, you've referred to her. She wondered if the crosses would send a, quote, welcoming message to motorists as they pass through Radnor. Well, th- this is uh, I, another I, one. Hold on, Rich. I don't know if, if you heard. I was talking before about the debate in nearby White Marsh Township. Uh, sure. uh, and over, I, I over know White Marsh as well, and, and over the idea that they would have a sign that says uh, uh, "White Marsh Township, welcome to White Marsh Township, a great place to live, work, and worship." The idea that the word "worship" would be offensive to people. Oh, oh, absolutely, and this fits right into this. Uh, another one: symbols can bring both positive and negative connotations to individuals and groups. Said Winters, are there less ostentatious? ostentatious ways to reflect a Catholic institution? Yeah, I mean, uh, can you think of one, by the way? What what would be less ostentatious? <laughs> no. Than, than one of the ironies other? here is not, not a couple hundred yards from the proposed site of the, uh, the, the overpass is the, is the Villanova Chapel, which has two, you know, high towering spires with crosses on top. Can you imagine that? Uh, imagine that How, a, 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 a Catholic chapel with a cross on top. Uh, Look, so um, here, here's here's the question that I would ask. What is because I you'll tell me immediately the um, the mascot for the Villanova sports teams. Uh, the Wildcat. OK, if if they put Wildcats on top of these pillars, would anyone object? <laughs> no, no, of course not. not. I mean, it's it's just like they wouldn't object if they put up huskies at the University of Washington. But right. but the but the idea that there is something uniquely objectionable to someone uh, displaying a cross is is one of those things that I find extraordinarily weird. You know what it reminds me of? There was a, a debate that I was involved with about the Mojave Cross. Someone had put up a cross, and it was a war memorial in the middle of the Mojave Desert, where and nobody goes. And there's been this ongoing case about dismantling the cross because there might be some desert tortoises or some jackrabbits or some cactuses that would actually see the Mojave Cross. Or there's a cross on top of Mount Soledad um, in, uh, in, in La Jolla, in, in San Diego County in California. This notion that really there is something virtuous or American or appropriate about making war on religious symbolism is so far beyond what any of our founding fathers would have viewed as necessary to guarantee freedom of worship. This does not, by the way, it, it isn't required by the Establishment Clause because you're not establishing religion, right? by allowing Villanova University to build an overpass that actually has a cross on top of a pillar. And you know what? You're, you're also, in terms of the free exercise of religion, free exercise of religion does not require that you uh, involve yourself in interfering with somebody else's free exercise. Rich, I appreciate your background and your additional information on this particular controversy. If there's anyone who is worried about somehow theocracy creeping in into American life, you can give us a call. On the Michael Medved Show, it is 55 minutes past the hour. Uh, You can sign up uh, immediately for any one of Hillsdale College's great courses about American heritage, about our Constitution, about guarantees of religious liberty, They have a new course on American heritage. And just try it. As they used to say in the old commercial, try it. You'll like it. Uh, You can hear the first 45-minute lecture by Dr. Larry Arn, president of Hillsdale College, about why it's important to learn America's heritage. And uh, you'll be hooked. And then the entire course, by the way, free, but also invaluable. Go to medvedforhillsdale.com. That's medvedforhillsdale.com. Let's go quickly to David in Burbank, California. David, you're on the Michael Medved Show. Hey, Michael. How are you? I'm well. Great, great. Uh, What's your opinion of uh, if a mosque 
let's say, in a California city, is broadcasting the uh, prayer, of the, the call to prayer, or the call for prayer. The Meuzein, uh, yeah. Pardon me? Yeah, the, the Meuzein, yeah. They, yes, I'm, I'm very familiar with it. When, when, by the way, when you go to visit Jerusalem, as I hope you will, um, you hear it all the time because they're uh, about the population of the city of Jerusalem, municipality of Jerusalem, is over a fourth Muslim, but go ahead. Okay, I, I've never been to Israel. Um, so how how do uh, Muslim is there a, a Jewish call to prayer in the same area that no. Muslims were here? No, nope. Okay, because we don't do that. I mean, they do. Um, and here is I I do think they have restrictions on how loud uh, you can make it because there are some folks who try to make it very very loud, and because they start very early in the morning when it's still dark. Um, restrictions in, in California or Israel. And I, there's, I know that there are some restrictions in Israel about how loud and what time of day and how much you can disturb people, but those are the only restrictions. Well, I would, uh, I'd like your opinion. I would consider hearing at any volume a call to prayer from, I'm, I was going to say any religion, but I'm, I, honestly I'm thinking of, uh, of Islam. I would consider that offensive at any volume. Why? It, Did you it, find church bells offensive? No, I don't, actually. Okay, me neither. And, you know, I, I don't go to church. I don't go to mosque. I, I think I actually, um, I don't agree with President Obama, who once said that the hearing the call to prayer at sunset is one of the most beautiful sounds he can remember. I don't have that reaction to to the sound. But well, it's it's one neither, of those things. Neither, Why should it bother you? Neither, uh, neither do I. Okay, whether it's beautiful or not, that's, that's a, a subjective opinion. I happen to be a musician, and um, some things are musically very beautiful. I'm not listening to... That okay, I, 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 under, I understand. Statement. The point is, I think it's a beautiful thing that we live in a country where people can have a call to prayer, and as long as you're not waking people up at four in the morning, as long as it's not cranked up to deafening volume, we live in a country where people can express themselves without damaging anyone in this greatest nation on God's green earth.